This is another iRaw podcast. <coughs> to be honest, despite the fact that I've been studying this for over a year now, I hadn't really thought of the law that way. But- Welcome to the final episode of season one of The Animal Turn, where we've been speaking to scholars about animals and the law and unpacking a variety of concepts. Normally, I keep my gratitude until the end of an episode, but I'm really proud and grateful to be here. Uh, I'm nothing but a lowly graduate student who had an idea and went to Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicker at Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple. Uh, with an idea and they supported me and here we are you know a short while later with the first season done so i just wanted to say some thank yous right up in the beginning Uh, thank you sue and will for all that you've done Uh, also a huge thank you to all of the interviewees from this first season without you it would have been boring because i would have been fumbling and trying to figure out these words all by myself so uh, to Will Kimmelke, Leslie Bisgould, Angela Fernandez, Manisha Decker, Charlotte Blattner, Siobhan O'Sullivan, Saskia Stuckey, Frederick Couture-Boudou, Valerie Giroux, and my two guests today, Hira Jalil and Paulina Simonek. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Also a huge thank you to all of you that have been listening. I've been really humbled to see that people are listening, you know, uh, it's always amazing when you see that number tick up. So thank you uh, so much for for supporting this relatively new kid on the block. Uh, And I hope that we grow bigger and brighter from here. I'm happy to say that there will be a second season and hopefully many more seasons thereafter. Uh, But without any more gushing from me, because I know that that's not what you've come here to listen to, let me give a brief overview about what today's episode is going to be about. So the intention of episode 10 was to try and round out the first season. We've spoken about some very diverse and complicated concepts. And I find that review helps me to learn and process information. So with that in mind, I reached out to other graduate students to speak about these concepts, to speak about season one. What have you learned? What themes did you see emerging? What do you think about those themes? Um, And also what gaps were there? So to that end, I reached out to Paulina uh, Simonik, who's here with me at Queen's University and is doing her doctorate in politics I lie she's doing it in in philosophy Paulina is in the department of philosophy here at Queen's University being supervised by Will Kimlicka her research includes animal politics ethics and law as well as looking at intersectional ecofeminism and animal care theory Uh, She's received a variety of awards, including the McLaughlin Fellowship, and she's presented her work at the 2019 European Association for Critical Animal Studies. Paulina is just wonderful. Uh, She's also the leader of the Animal Reading Group here at Queen's University. So I was extremely happy and proud to have Paulina join on today's episode. Uh, But I really wanted a group of people, not just a one-on-one like we usually have. So I put out a call on Twitter, my new favorite place to be. (laughs) And uh, I was very thrilled to get someone come back to me. So Hira Jalil is a lawyer based out of Pakistan. She recently graduated with an LLM in animal law from Lewis and Clark Law School on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, Her LLM thesis was titled Wildlife Protection in Pakistan, an Overview of Statutory and Case law. Uh, So she analyzed the historical developments of wildlife protection laws and jurisprudence in Pakistan, the weaknesses and strengths of existing laws, as well as how superior courts in Pakistan um, approach different wildlife disputes. So Hira is an incredible person. You'll hear in throughout this episode that she speaks about Pakistan and she's very generous with examples from there. And she's quite clearly an up and coming lawyer. Now, what's really cool is you've got in this episode an emerging lawyer, an emerging philosopher, and an emerging podcaster all speaking about animals and the law. And together we try and unpack some of the main themes that emerged, which for us kind of centered around ideas of property, rights, uh, legal subjectivity, law, and social norms, uh, as well as entanglements and scales. So all of these come up in this episode, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to The Animal Turn, everybody. So today is the final episode, and I'm extremely excited 
uh, because it's the first time, not only is it the last episode of season one, yay, but it is also the first time that I'm taking a stab at recording more than one person in my Blanket Fort studio. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome two fellow graduate students who also have an interest in animals and the law. Uh, welcome to the show, Paulina and Hira. Thank you so much for having us. Hi. And, uh, Hi. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're coming from pretty different places. So Paulina, I know you from Queen's University. Uh, you are the leader of the Apple Reading Group, where we read about animal uh, articles uh, biweekly, which is really great. Uh, and here uh, we connected via Twitter. So we've met in very different places. And while Paulina is here in Kingston with me in Canada, Hira, you are in Pakistan, is that correct? Yes, that's right. So what time, what time is it there for you now? It's 6 p.m. right now, 6.05. So you're winding down. For us, it's yeah. 9 a.m., so we're in, we're in different rhythms. So before we get into the thick of today's episode, which is with the intention of outlining what we've learned from season one, I'd like both of you to take a you know a spot of time to tell me about yourselves and what your interests are in animal scholarship or animals and the law. Uh, Hira, why don't we why don't we start with you? Okay, so I have I'm actually not a graduate student right now. I've recently graduated with my LLM in animal law from Lewis and Clark. Well, yeah. Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've graduated from uh, the Lewis and Clark Law School on a Fulbright scholarship. And my interest uh, in animal studies, I, I guess I could trace it back to when I rescued my dog, Peanut. And uh, so, I mean, before that, I'd kind of thought about, in, you know, our interactions with animals and I'd had like companion animals before, but, you know, they'd been like family animals and it wasn't something that I'd given a whole lot of thought to. But when I kind of rescued her and I started living with her and interacting with her on a daily basis, I realized that, I mean, I started thinking more about how she is not, she's not an object. She's not an it. She is mm -hmm. a, an individual. She's a person. I mean, to me, she's a person. She has a personality. Um, she's a friend. So in law school, one of my professors was once just telling us about this animal law conference he's about to attend in the US. And I was just like, animal law, that's a thing. And I mean, I was pretty, <laughs> I was pretty directionless in law school in that I didn't really know what area of law I was super interested in yet. I mean, I kind of liked some things here and there, but nothing super solid. And when I heard animal law, it was just like, you know, that eureka moment where everything sort of came together. And I was like, wow, I mean, this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to, you know, animals and how they're treated in Pakistan and how no one considers them individuals or, or you know, like beings with personality. And uh, I'm studying to be a lawyer. So it's kind of the perfect amalgamation of these two things that I really want to kind of do um, in my life. So I applied actually to the law firm where my professor was a partner to work on some animal law cases. And I worked there for two years. Meanwhile, I applied for a Fulbright scholarship. I got it. I applied to study animal law at Lewis and Clark. And I uh, I was just there, there last year for my LLM in animal law, and I just wrapped up and came back home. It's been a month now. Wow, incredible. And and is there a particular type of animal law that you focused on, or is animal law just uh, its own its own bubble? So animal law is, because it's such a niche and kind of growing field right now, I don't really know of people who specialize in a certain kind of animal law. Um, generally, it's just sort of, working however you can within the legal framework to help animals. That being said, there are certain kind of areas of law that you can sort of specialize in that you can also use to help animals. One, for instance, constitutional law or consumer law. Um, so there, there is kind of that. But I don't personally do or want to specialize in a certain kind of animal law because it's a growing field. It's a very underdeveloped field in my own country. So I feel like mm -hmm. a more generalist position it kind of suits me better than only catering to one kind of animal. It's great to have you. And I think that what's really interesting about the three of us sitting here all together is that uh, I'm kind of halfway through my PhD. Hira, you've just finished uh, your graduate studies and Paulina's just getting started into her, into her uh, studies. Um, but you've also just finished a master's degree, Paulina. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, yourself and your interest in animals and the law. Sure. Uh, thank you. So 
As long as I can remember, I've always loved animals and felt connected with them. All my childhood memories are filled with, you know, talking and playing with animals. And um, that sort of love grew and grew. And in elementary school, I decided to go vegetarian. I started volunteering at an animal hospital and then in high school at an animal shelter. And then later on, I realized that um, I wanted to advocate for animals in a meaningful way, and I became more and more protective over them in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was doing my undergrad, I was a double major in uh, fine art and in philosophy. And when applying to grad school, I wanted to uh, really consider what way would be more effective uh, for advocating for animals and their rights. So I decided to kind of channel my love of animals through my writing as a philosopher. So uh, I decided to uh, pursue a master's in philosophy. And uh, the more I learned and about animal ethics, the more I sort of was trying to figure out how I can contribute to healing our relationships with humans and non-human animal others. And what really got me into animal law was actually in the first year of my master's reading uh, Manisha Decca's unpublished manuscript, uh, Animals as Legal Beings. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, that was during that time, I was sort of exposed to these ideas for the first time. And uh, that's when I kind of learned that uh, the legal status and subjectivity of animals is sort of a central question that we need to tackle. So in my uh, master's thesis, that's something I actually took up. And I'm deeply actually indebted to Manisha Deka for letting us, the animal reading group, uh, read her unpublished manuscript uh, before uh, it was published. And um, sort of I based my ideas around uh, the content of that book. And basically, in my uh, thesis, I examined and analyzed the various positions and approaches to the paralyzing property personhood debate and concluded by offering my own uh, conception of what I call animal personhood, kind of as an alternative post-anthropocentric legal subjectivity for both uh, human and animals. Um, And basically... Uh, To put it in Will's words, I realized that law is central to the oppression of animals. It is the legal system which authorizes humans to harm and exploit animals. And legal reform is therefore essential to ending their oppression, end quote. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think we've got a, a power. We've got a power team here to uh, to achieve today's goals. Uh, we've got someone who's got a legal background, someone who's got a philosophy background, and of course, in season one, we had a combination of lawyers, historians, philosophers, and political scientists. So, both of you kind of touched on really important uh, ideas in your introductions of yourselves. I think both of you showed that you came to understanding animals and the law, but how you came to see animals, actually, uh, was something that Charlotte said in one of, uh, you know, in the beginning of uh, my episode with her, where she said, you know, when asking the question about animals and the law, it's actually how do we come to animals? So whether it was meeting Peanut or volunteering at an animal shelter, you came to see animals which is really a powerful thing uh and then of course both of you touched on the idea of animals as its versus property Uh, so that was one of the key ideas that came up in season one Uh, i don't know if you felt the same but for me it seemed as though property status just came up in every single episode right so there's this uh reoccurring theme of a lot of actually interconnected ideas. So we have this model of humanity that's defined in opposition to animality, and that maps onto, you know, the categories of personhood and property, which then, you know, directly correlates to the rights doctrine and the welfare or anti-cruelty laws. And then, you know, we have the themes of visibility and invisibility and the dichotomy between, you know, legal subject and legal object. How about you, Hira? Did you did you also what kind of themes and subjects or ideas did you see coming up in season one overall? Definitely. I think this concept of property versus personhood for non-human animals was like you just said, I think it came up in every single episode. And I mean rightly so, because I think this is a major kind of debate in the animal legal um kind of sphere. And I mean, besides that, the use of animal law, a lot of, I mean, when with Will's first episode, when he talks about how ad, like animal law is basically used as a way to kind of keep animals oppressed in a sense, right? Like it's animal law exists to authorize someone to use and harm animals, I believe is what he said. And I mean, that kind of, I mean, 
to be honest, despite the fact that I've been studying this for over a year now, I hadn't really thought of the law that way because we kind of approach the law as something that's meant to protect and safeguard, right? Um, and mm. to kind of kind of think of law as being a tool that would be used to oppress non-humans more than to safeguard and protect them, even if it is anti-cruelty laws. I, I found that a very interesting concept. And I think that also came up a couple of times um, during the season. Um, as well as the entire idea of the lack of transparency in animal agriculture and the lack of transparency in the lived experiences of animals, which kind of prevents the law from getting to them because they kind of live in this little, um, behind this whale where humans just don't see them so we can put them out of our minds. Yeah, you're both so right. Uh, you know, there's the bigger idea of the category human, what does it mean to be human? Uh, and then there's also the instrumentalization of law. Like I had always thought, oh, you know, people talk about animal rights law all the time. They're like, oh, but we are following all of the, the animal rights laws in, in this operation. Uh, but then when you take what Will and, and what Leslie also said, was that no, these laws are not to serve animals. There's no, these laws exist to actually protect industries to, to achieve the bare minimum. Uh, and, and I think a core concept that came up there again and again was this idea of necessity. What does it mean to be necessarily used? Right, because we have this idea that uh, animals are at least protected by anti-cruelty laws, but when we really examine uh, what unnecessary suffering means, uh, as several of the guests have mentioned, it really just refers back to what humans uh, deem as beneficial or convenient uh, use of animals in general. And I think that the general public would find it shocking to really consider the fact that animals do not have uh, rights as property to objects. Definitely. I was also going to say that even I feel like that kind of concept, even outside anti-cruelty laws, I feel like I see that also a lot in terms of wildlife law and conservation because a lot of times and just in terms of like the discourse around it because a lot of times when we talk about conservation we talk about protecting a species or like mm -hmm. conserving them or making sure they don't go extinct and on the face of it it might seem like it's for the benefit of the species but ultimately the entire kind of idea behind it is to conserve the species so humans can continue to keep enjoying them even or you know just even if it's purely for aesthetic purposes, it's ultimately the human that's in the center of the conversation, not really the animal. We want to conserve them so that our future generations can continue to enjoy their use in a sense. Yeah, this was something I really hadn't thought of before is how we speak about species. So this tension between a broader category versus an individual and what role that plays within the law. So I think uh, it was Charlotte who said, you know, we would never have this kind of broad category of human, like th this is a right for all humans type thing, because at some point when you're using, and I know that sounds weird because you're thinking, oh, but human rights law, but that is broken up into a variety of different categories and ideas. And I think what Charlotte was pointing to is when you start to speak, like you said, uh, Hira, when you start to speak at this big macro level, kind of the nuances become really divorced. You start to see all animals as this kind of like monolithic single category. And uh, I think both Charlotte and Angela picked up on this, that that in history and in law, we we don't really see differences between animals. <laughs> This is the challenge of dealing with three people. I don't know how to direct the questions. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so in thinking about that and thinking about the difference between, you know, bigger groups and individuals, the idea of personhood came up. What do you guys think personhood means? Uh, and, and perhaps, Paulina, you could start us off here because you've dealt quite extensively with personhood. What do you think it means in terms of thinking through these tensions of individual versus group identities? Right. So that's a great question. Um, I My view sort of aligns with uh, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka in the sense that I believe that personhood should be synonymous with uh, the idea of selfhood, the idea of uh, a being that has a subjective experience of their own life in the world, has their own ends that they pursue and desires. And uh, from that, I think that 
that creates a qualitatively different moral consideration as opposed to just being merely alive or uh, an object, an animate object. And I think from that fact of sentience, it creates certain uh, moral duties and responsibilities that we have towards um, particular individual selves. Uh, so I very much tie personhood to the idea of sentience. And I think that that is the sort of ground zero for giving rights uh, to a certain subject in order essentially to be protected uh, from harm and exploitation, and then at sort of a second level as being respected of a member of a certain community, whether that's a human or non-human or mixed community. Well, that's that's interesting, but I think it's also it to be challenged because of how personhood is currently being used, um, at least in a legal sense. Sentience doesn't seem to be a central feature of what personhood is legally, right? When you've got corporations, uh, you know, a corporation is not sentient, but in the law, it's considered a person. Right. I think I'm uh, definitely referring to moral personhood as opposed to um personhood in the abstract sense of, I think Manisha Deca mentioned that a lot of uh, legal scholars make much of the idea of corporations and, you know, ships uh, being uh, persons. But I think that if we ground personhood in uh, the moral aspect of why it is relevant to be respected as a subject as opposed to an object, um, animals definitely qualify for personhood. Uh, That is not to say that I completely agree with the extension of legal personhood as it is right now to animals because of its problematic history and uh, the origin that it sort of stems from and the anthropocentric tendencies. Um, in as Dinek, uh, Manisha Deca mentioned, the sameness arguments where, you know, personhood is granted just in virtue of certain animals, certain species being similar to human beings. I don't think that's the right approach. But I do mm-hmm. think, uh, I think it's there's a wide consensus, or at least agreement, uh, with ever most of the guests that property uh, property is not a acceptable status or defensible status for animals. So I definitely think personhood is uh, better than property. One hundred percent, and I think the the concept that Manisha brought forward about legal being this, so she's actually giving a third way of thinking through this. You know, over overwhelmingly. Uh, People in season one told me that, you know, the way the law understands uh, things is in two different categories, persons versus objects, and that animals are squarely put in the object category, not the person category. And Manisha was very skillful, I think, in showing how personhood has these you know, as it currently stands, is kind of born of both legal, religious, and and like ideas of a rational human. Uh, and that in developing her concept of legal beingness, she's trying to maybe show that subjects are actually embodied, they're vulnerable. Um, you know, there's a relationality. You can't forget about the relationships, right? So let's possibly move now. So we've spoken a bit about property and personhood, which for me were two of the biggest concepts to emerge in in season one. But the next big category I think that was hovering there almost constantly was the idea of rights. What did you see or learn about rights, uh, Hira, in listening to season one? So I feel like the rights discourse generally and rights as a concept is extremely kind of misunderstood maybe when it comes to the actual and I'm not saying this is something I noticed over the season obviously everyone who was in the who was speaking in the season were extremely like uh, experienced scholars and they knew what they were talking about when I'm talking about like the general public and in mm-hmm. my own experience like colloquially or like in layman terms people think mm-hmm. people just don't get what you know what what the meaning behind animal rights really is and what it means to be giving animal rights um and i feel like it it is a challenging kind of idea um because and it ties very closely to personhood because the way animals will get the same kind of rights as human beings or the kind of rights that they would obviously want or would kind of apply to them it, they won't obviously be the exact same as human beings because obviously animals we assume aren't interested in things like the right to vote, for instance, right? But Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at is that personhood is kind of closely linked with the idea of 
giving legal rights until the idea of personhood is sort of clarified there will always in my mind i feel like there'll always be that confusion about what we mean by giving animal rights because even if you really think about it anti cruelty laws in a sense do give animals certain rights right i mean it gives the animal the or at least it gives the state to right the right to enforce you know if like to enforce any um to, sorry wrong this, doing. This, yeah wrong, wrong doing or if anything's anything wrong that's happening to an animal the state can sort of step in and say okay we're going to like prosecute this because this isn't because the animal has a right under this law to not suffer right that's also mm-hmm. a kind of legal right but then another kind of legal right is like the right to go to court or the right or the or access to justice right and animals don't have that and animals in the kind of legal system we have right now might possibly never have that because they'll always because our legal system and as this is kind of going back to what you guys were just talking about and as Manisha Deka discussed our legal system is designed keeping human beings in mind it's not an animal centric legal system it's a human centric legal system so the i so rights will always be an idea that will be in tension with when it comes to applicability to animals for this reason that the entire concept of rights just isn't designed for animals and i feel like this is something that really kind of needs to be explored even more and i think do it even throughout the season i think that's something i noticed a lot that a lot of people really are getting into this whole idea mm-hmm. of maybe we should just kind of step away from rights as how we humans understand it and kind of design a new system for animals well that's an important point because there's a lot of challenging ways of we think about rights uh you know rights has been associated with colonial structures it's been associated with what we think are uh, you know that we only design rights for particular people in mind so it's not even you know coming to the division between humans and animals but that particular people are not thought of uh in in a rights based framework but then i also struggle so like i also struggle what 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 is the way forward did what is the beyond a rights based framework what what could we possibly do differently in future Uh, so yes animals don't currently have rights and if giving them rights is not the way forward what is well i definitely think that giving animals rights is the way forward i mean if we just look at the any sort of welfare reforms uh the failures are sort of uh evidenced by the fact that uh cruelty and suffering is permitted you know we're allowed to be violent towards animals and exploit them and uh I thought it was interesting uh I think Saski Stukai she brought up a kind of a way of reframing this sort of dualism between animal welfare mm-hmm. laws and uh animal rights and she kind of frames uh it in terms of warfare by referring back to uh international humanitarian law and which is like a branch of law that deals with warfare in the human case and regulates what can be done in Uh, wars or um, conflict and she says that this she makes a parallel to you know the animal welfare law and how we are currently in a state of war with animals at least on a symbolic level and how when we reframe it in terms of warfare uh we it kind of illuminates the fact that um in the human case you know these uh international humanitarian laws are meant to safeguard um humans and human rights and they're just sort of in the exceptional cases whereas the norm should be peace and equality and um living in a world ideally where there uh, are human rights and so kind of when she makes that connection with welfare laws and warfare laws in the animal case uh she kind of makes room for imagining what peaceful relationships would look like and a sort of complementary animal uh law of peace as she says. Yeah, that was a uh, really incredible the, the maneuver she made there in introducing her concept of uh, animal law of peace, right? Uh, and I think she really showed how the discourses in international humanitarian law and in animal welfare law are really similar to one another almost using exactly the same phrases to describe uh where you know violence could be justified uh, and again pointing out the concept of necessity when something is necessary uh so it was 
I think she was one of the few scholars that we spoke to in season one who said, you know, we need a combination of animal welfare and animal rights that just focusing on one, which seems to be the, the I, I don't think in practice it's ever just focusing on one, but at least in terms of how we think through these problems, they seem to be completely divergent from one another. There's no complementing animal welfare law and animal rights law. Right. And uh, I was just curious, you know, how would that look like in practice? What sort of animals would be governed under a sort of law of peace and which ones would sort of be the last to make it into sort of uh, at least a rights, uh, animal rights kind of framework? Yeah, that that was something that came up quite a bit uh, is, you know, we spoke about how I think it's the chimpanzee project came up quite a few times uh, in terms of how there are steps being moved towards creating personhood for specific animals. But as Leslie pointed out, like how long is this going to take, right? How long would it take until eventually we start considering agricultural animals or we start considering, uh, you know, animals that are not as charismatic? Right. And the approach in itself is problematic because it's anthropocentric. It's uh, centering the human and then offering rights only ser- simply in virtue of being similar to human. I think Manisha Deca brought that up, like the sameness argument is uh, not the right approach to go. Uh, Hira, do you have any thoughts on this type of these types of tensions? Yeah, definitely. Um, So going back to your initial question of what beyond rights, I feel like Frederick kind of touched on that when he talked about animal autonomy. Um, I feel like even when you're giving, when you're talking about rights for animals, I think his approach was kind of one that I kind of really resonated with, where he says that, you know, animal desires matter as well. And it's not just about like their negative rights or just like stepping away and just doing nothing, but also kind of keeping in mind what an animal would want and obviously then again I I understand the tension there is obviously you're still kind of speaking for the animal and you're still kind of inserting those blanks yourself what you think the animal would want but I mean we have a lot of scientific research now and I think in at least some cases it's probably safe to say that you can consider the interest of the animal when you're talking about a rights framework for them. Right. And and I think it's not just about trying to understand their emotional needs. Uh, You know, it's also, you know, who was it? I can't recall, but it came up, I think, with Frederic and with Charlotte, where this idea of animals is having their own nations. Uh, So it's not just about considering what they want, I think, emotionally or socially, but also how their space matters, how we constantly encroach you know, that maybe they have some claim to autonomy of space as well, that this is our land and that it's so hard to not just keep coming back to humans though, because now I want to say, and therefore we need to curtail human behavior. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's about finding respect between different nations, about creating a different, like a different lexicon, like a different legal lexicon for how we could maybe take animals seriously. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, there we go, everybody. We're done. We've solved, we've solved everything. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I could just add to that. Well, as Will mentioned, when we're talking about animal rights, there's many different things that that is sort of referring to. So in the traditional sense of animal rights, um, in terms of negative uh, universal basic rights, the right not to be killed, the right not to be harmed, uh, that's just sort of the basic sense. And uh as Will and Sue propose sort of a membership model of rights, that's a sort of uh, different approach. Um, it's still a rights-based approach, but if um, that's just another way to think of it as social, a social membership model where um, perhaps animals would not have uh, full rights as persons, but maybe as workers or as family members, et cetera. Yeah, and I think he very, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? He very convincingly argued that maybe instead of jumping straight for personhood, that this should be the legal the legal way forward, that instead of trying to rehaul the whole system, that eventually as we start to see animals, like you say, Paulina, as workers uh, or as caretakers, that then that'll pave the way for a bigger, broader conception of either animals as you know, persons or as animals, as legal beings, as, as Manisha suggests, because uh, that was something that, so, so we've now picked up, I think, on three different way forwards that, that people 
membership rights was one way. The idea of animal law of peace was another way forward. And the idea of starting to, which I think is tied to membership rights, the idea of taking animals' autonomy and desires seriously. So more, more consideration, not just for negative rights, but for positive rights. Uh, I think there was also a, another way forward before we move from here was Charlotte Blattner. I think she provided a very rigorous and, and potentially very practical way of thinking of how states could be really important to providing a future for animals. Did you guys find that too? Yes, I found her proposition very uh, compelling and the way that uh, she says we need to make a distinction between prohibitions and rights. And there's this sort of threat of outsourcing as soon as there's um, higher regulations being in place. So uh, essentially, there's a regulatory competition between states where they compete to decrease the amount of animal protection. And this is an uh, overall trend or a race uh, sort of to the bottom. And it's capital that's driving this competition. And um, so she kind of flips this and says that we should build some sort of uh, jurisdictional net across the globe to help protect animals and anchor this in trade law or investment principles or certain financial institutions to kind of reverse this and create a, ideally create a ranking system where there's uh, a competition or a race to the top uh, where there's higher and higher animal protections. I'm not exactly sure what would motivate um, states to do this if it's not for profit, but um, maybe I'll turn that to Hira. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I found Charlotte's episode especially interesting for a couple of reasons. One was when she talks about international law and like obviously international law generally as a legal kind of concept or a legal institution is weaker as compared to the domestic law because of sovereignty, state sovereignty and all of those, it's really hard to enforce international law, right? Um, but I found when she talked about how Western countries are more consumers of animal corpses and the global South is more producer of animal corpses, which would make kind of an international framework difficult. I found that really interesting. And I kind of also, um, it made me think more about also how this entire conversation around animal rights, even even this like welfare versus rights or, but she said that's why it's unlikely for states to form consensus. And I think that's also kind of true for the conversation around animal welfare, animal rights. I feel like this conversation is happening a lot more in the West than it's happening in the global South. And I find, I, and I find that concerning because I mean, in the West, for instance, just with farmed animals, there's a lot more consumption. There's a whole factory farming CAFO system that I, I mean, I'm sure is, they're in the global south as well, but and is increasingly more so, right? Because mm -hmm. the global south is kind of trying to catch up with the western with with western countries, and so if this conversation just keeps happening in the western world without kind of involving the global south, then my sort of concern with this is that it's again just going to remain a race to the bottom, where you're going to ruin animal lives to the point where you're going to then start having conversations about billions of animals versus just maybe even millions or thousands who are suffering right mm -hmm. now. Um, and so I found her episode especially insightful in that sense. Yeah, I agree with you. And I thought that, you know, as you were talking now, I was thinking about Brazil, right? Brazil is one of the biggest producers of beef in the world. And I think what Charlotte did was... While she made these connections clearer, you know, as you say, there are different spaces of consumption and production happening, but they are interlinked with one another. And I think this isn't just the case for, for animals. You see it often with, you know, human, like human production systems, like the creation of different garments, garment industries, uh, are notoriously bad for human workers or the making of cell phones, for example, that the places that consume these products the most tend to export or outsource, as Paulina said, the, the production elsewhere, where there are perhaps more lackluster uh, laws or potentially not, you know, just trying to find means and ways of bolstering economic growth. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, right? Economic growth. 
Exactly. And that kind of, I think, touches upon another theme that, I mean, I would have liked to see discussed more, but was touched upon in a few episodes, like Manisha's episode, for instance, about intersectionality and generally the interconnectedness of oppressions. And I think that's um, an extremely important theme and is a growing theme in the animal legal movement about how you kind of, the law, if it addresses the um, the conditions of animals and if it wants to improve the conditions of animals it will also kind of have to improve human conditions and the two will kind of have to go hand in hand because animal oppression is often linked with uh, gender is often gendered or is often linked with race and class oppression and I think that is kind of a conversation that is increasingly happening more in the uh, in animal circles and I think should also continue to happen more and more and maybe we could see more of that next season. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I mean, I do think it was touched on, like you say, but it's it's difficult to it's almost impossible to really speak about animals without speaking about humans because we are entangled. We're historically entangled. We're ecologically entangled. And um, as Charlotte said, we are legally entangled, you know, Uh, so to try and pry them apart is, I think, analytically useful. Uh, it's, it's enabling that makes these kinds of divergences visible. But I think we do need, again, we need a language for trying to understand the entanglements of oppressions, but uh, not to collapse these oppressions into one another, not to say that all of them are one and the same. And I think it was Frederic that maybe he switched it a little bit. Instead of thinking about this as a project of speciesism, for example, he said that this is a resistance to ableism, that actually what underlies our consideration for animals as being deficient is is not so much a resistance of them as animals in and of themselves, but a resistance, you know, the propping up of this idea of the rational human, which is something you touched on a bit earlier, Paulina. Right. So I I agree with you and I agree with Frederic. I think that uh, Manisha Deca also mentions this, that uh, personhood in itself as a legal category for humans is problematic. Um, certain humans aren't even considered persons. And the idea of personhoods originally had this uh, specific idea of what a human was, a male, upper class, uh, non-relationally autonomous person. Uh, person, uh, neurotypical, uh, without a cognitive disability, sort of. And so when Frederic was bringing in uh, sort of a dis- disability framework, that's very helpful in rethinking uh, personhood, even in the human case. And I think that it's really hard to separate um, the two, the human and the animal. It's The two are sort of interconnected. As I said earlier, when we started off this episode, humanity is sort of defined against um, animality. So as long as we have this uh, distinction and this division, um, there's always going to be the risk that certain humans are going to be dehumanized and treated, quote unquote, like animals, and that animals are going to just be treated like objects, like not animals, like inanimate objects. Hmm. And Hera spoke to something that she would have liked to hear more about in these conversations about law and the animals, and that is this entanglement, this intersectionality with gender, with race, with nationhood. What else do you think was potentially missing in this conversation about animals and the law? So, I mean, for me personally, one thing, and gen- and this is actually an area of interest, like a research area of interest for me as well, um, is I feel like so, for instance, in my own country, our constitution is a religious constitution. It's an Islamic republic. And I feel like that's true for a lot of different countries where they cannot look at the law outside the lens of, say, for instance, religion, right? And I think a lot of the Western discourse around animal law is secular in nature, um, which kind of, I think, leaves out a very important discussion that needs to be had about the role of religion or culture even um, when it comes to protecting animals, because a lot of times those those influences domestically make a world of difference for how uh, animal legal discourse is kind of had. Um, so, for instance, in my country, I you can't discuss the law without discussing what Islam says about the law because it's a it's an Islamic constitution, and any law that's made against Islam is automatically illegal, uh, is automatically unconstitutional. So, in that sense, 
I feel like those kind of little nuances, which maybe aren't necessarily very Western in nature, I would definitely like to hear more about. I would like to hear more about those kind of, you know, cultural or religious influences that make a difference when you're talking about improving the lives or rights or the status of animals. I think that's a that's an important critique. So in general, I you know all of the people who I had interviewed are primarily scholars from the West. Very few scholars uh, from from elsewhere, and I think that raises questions about you know legal systems are not the same everywhere. Um, they're not standardized, uh, and also how we understand the law, like you say, through through religious ideals. I think I would push back a little bit on the idea that. Western law is secular. Uh, I know that we like to think that West, uh, the West, con- like Western countries, have created a division of state and and religion. But I don't know. I find that, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong here, but I find that the way in which this creating of the human, su- like human supremacy above all else in the world, is tied to often, you know, religious ideas, uh, Christian ideas. Uh, a lot of this. It came up in Leslie's episode where we spoke about how animals were being tried uh, and they were being tried through often religious ideas. So I, I wonder how like history, uh, you know, and the role of Christianity in Western law has shaped the kind of ideas we see today, even though they're touted as being secular. Um, but valid point. I agree with you entirely. We need to unpack more how religion plays into these. Do you perhaps have an example from Pakistan that would make this clearer? Um, Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys are aware, but just um, in May, late May, there was this decision from one of our provincial high courts that released an elephant in the Islamabad Zoo. Islamabad is our capital city. Uh, So there's this elephant there who's been basically chained there for three decades now and a petition was filed to get him released and the court released uh, and the decision that the court came out with was really progressive for animals they talk about a lot of animal rights for instance but a large chunk of that decision quotes islamic law because it's practically impossible in pakistan to really kind of justify um any progressive rights-based regime without drawing from Islamic principles. And I and I think that decision when I was reading it was super insightful because, I mean, the judge didn't need to do it, but in the sense, he also kind of had to because of the way our legal system is set up. And also, I completely agree with you in that I definitely think Western the Western legal system draws heavily from, Christ, from Christian principles of this hierarchy and man being superior over, you know, well, even women and children and Mm-hmm. all of that so definitely I, I think religion plays a big role and I think a lot of times really it's really impossible at least in my context and even in the context of India which is our neighboring country um, where even though it's really progressive in terms of animal welfare but a lot of that is tied with human oppression because animal welfare is often used as a way to oppress humans of other religions who consume mm-hmm. meat for instance right so that's a very interesting conversation to be had as well. Um, so in, so th- those examples, I think, kind of illustrate the different cultural differences that kind of make a difference in the animal discourse. Yeah, and I think uh, India came up with the episode in Charlotte when we were speaking about these kinds of connections between different countries where as much as you, there are certain areas in India where you, you, are, you are not allowed to kill an animal, particularly a cow, uh, there are still means and ways of getting cows across borders so that they can still be you know, sent elsewhere, uh, so that they can be slaughtered and then sent elsewhere. So, yeah, that this is really an important uh topic and maybe the next time we delve into animals and the law or potentially creating a whole season on animals and religion I think would be really fascinating uh, Paulina did you have any other gaps that you thought were emerging in season one um, not in particular uh, I think that you know there are a lot of uh, ideas pertaining to how we could move forward in improving our relationship with animals uh, it from a legal perspective, uh, the problem, what we have got wrong, what we can learn from it. And there is also a lot of insightful and inspiring propositions that were put forth by Charlotte and, and others. So I don't think that anything is necessarily missing. Okay, well, that's, that's great. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, 
so just to sum up here some of the big themes that we've seen. So we've spoken about property, we've spoken about rights, legal subjectivity, uh, we spoke about entanglement, entanglement of different identities, different places, different laws. Uh, and to some extent, we've spoken, I think, again, another theme that came up throughout season one was scale. You know, are we looking at individuals? Are we looking at groups? Are we looking at states or like global like global scales um the final theme for me that really came up again and again was you know which comes first a legal change or social change i don't know if either of you have any thoughts on that that's actually something i've thought about and i continue to think about a lot um and to me i feel like maybe social change has to um precede legal change because I've seen it and, it and domestically in my own country, I've seen lots of examples of really, really progressive judgments being passed, right? Um, where vis-a-vis -vis environmental rights, this one that I mentioned about animal rights, human rights, and the court is doing its job. And a lot of times courts do tend to, you know, because they're not elected, they could, they can maybe, I mean, again, it depends on the judge. I don't want to generalize, but you know, a lot of times courts can be more progressive than maybe society. But I think unless society as a whole, at least in dem democratic systems, are is willing to kind of accept that legal change, it's really hard for that change to translate on ground. And, mm -hmm. I, and again, I, I'm only speaking for my own country and what I've kind of witnessed happen um, is that even when courts oftentimes pass really progressive decisions or lawmakers make really progressive laws um, unless there's will in society in civil society for those laws to be enforced or if there's unless there's acceptance of those laws it's really hard for those laws to make a difference for the people that they're people or individuals or beings that they're catering to so for me yeah. i think I, I think definitely social change has to precede legal change I also think, you know, something that Siobhan O'Sullivan brought up was the idea of democracy. And I think Charlotte mentioned it too, both Siobhan and Charlotte, that, you know, there is in general, I think, a social idea that animals should be uh, protected, that we shouldn't be hurting animals. I do think that this already has some social purchase, but there hasn't been any sort of industrial will or industry will or state will to change that. And I thought that Siobhan brought up a really interesting idea there of bringing politics in, saying that, you know, it's all good and well for us as, as citizens to say this is what we want, but unless we enable that politically, unless we make it something that is politically desired, uh, will anything really manifest uh, that maybe it needs to become something that we vote on? It needs to become something that we say, hey, we expect more from you so that there is this race to the top that, that Charlotte mentioned. Just to add to that, yeah, I definitely agree with here that uh, social and cultural attitudes definitely influence the laws that are passed. But we also have to consider that um, there's a lot of pushback from, you know, the animal use or animal-based industries that uh, struck down uh, any anti-cruelty provisions that would, you know, put a risk to animals, to their industry and to animals actually being recognized as rights holders. So they have a huge stake at maintaining the status quo. Yeah, and they're they're very powerful contenders, as we saw now in in Canada with the passing of Bill One Five Six. That uh, and again, something Siobhan pointed out is, I was like, "Yay!" The reason there are ag gag laws is because animal rights activists are making inroads. Industry is running scared, and she reminded me, "No, look at the power of industry to create laws." Right, because I think the general public, uh, as several people have mentioned, the general public wants, uh, doesn't believe in supporting animal cruelty, uh, to whatever extent that applies in their personal life, that's up for debate. But in general, people do want uh, animals to be protected. Yeah, and I think that uh, having visibility to those animals is really important. Uh, that was, again, something Siobhan spoke about is there is something significant about seeing it. And every time we curtail journalists or activists' ability to go into these places to expose harms that have happened to humans and harms that have happened to animals, we are curtailing democracy. And, uh, you know, this was something Leslie Bisgold also brought up was how, you know, ability to see and document the seal hunt had dramatic changes in, in Canada because Russia stopped purchasing these things. Uh, so 
yeah, there's there's an interesting. I think that maybe I would have liked more out of season one, potentially unpacking more of the political dimensions. You know, we spoke a lot at the social level and at the legal level, but somewhere in between there, there's a a, a, a political level that needs to be enabled to to make these futures possible. So we're nearing the end of uh, the episode now, and I'd ask both of you because it's become the trend in in season season one and i think i'm going to continue it i really like it as a as a thing uh, to read out a quote that you think either sums up season one or it's, ju- it's just of interest to you so you can explain to me why you like the quote uh Hira, why don't we start with you sure so my quote is basically um it comes from professor joyce tischler who founded the animal legal defense fund in 1979 and who i was lucky enough to be able to study under Um, this year during my LLM. Um, So I attended a student convention in December 2019, the Animal Legal Defense Fund student convention, and she was the keynote speaker there. And so my quote kind of comes from her, it's part of her keynote speech. And the reason I like this quote is because I feel like it's a perfect, it sums up what we as animal lawyers kind of aim to do to help animals through the law. So her quote is, My career is a reflection of our understanding that we have a duty to mend this world. We use our legal skills to protect animals precisely because most people choose not to. I caution each of us to ask ourselves on a regular basis, how can I help build a body of law that provides increased protections for animals that recognizes that they have interests and forces our society to consider those interests and balance them against the interests of human beings? And so I like this quote because I think it sums up animal law as a whole and what I think our role or my role as an animal lawyer kind of is within the larger scheme of animals and human interaction and in in, in this society. And it brings forward those entanglements you were talking about earlier that, that it really is impossible to to think about animals without also thinking about humans, but it's not about putting one above the other. So what what is your uh, where where are you going to from here, Hira? Uh, have you are you working as a lawyer now, or what is your what is your goal now? Definitely, I mean I've only been back a month, but I'm already working on some very exciting projects here in Pakistan um, to improve uh, animal well welfare slash animal rights. Um, it's really the line is really blurry here right now because that conversation isn't happening as much as I would like but uh, so I'm definitely working or and my plan is to keep working in this field because it's really really underdeveloped in Pakistan right now and I am so far the only person I know who's kind of studied this academically and I'm super happy because since I've been back people have already been reaching out to me to kind of and showing their interest in studying animal law and animal policy, which I find really encouraging because this this is a conversation that isn't happening. Like I've already said a million times, this is a conversation that isn't happening enough in my country and I would really like to see it happen more. So going to keep continue, going to continue practicing in this area and hopefully um, make Pakistan a better place for animals. Well, thank you for for all of the work you're doing, and congratulations on being being the the leader. Well, like it's it's incredible, and I look forward to feel free to send me any of your stuff in future. Uh, I look forward to engaging with you you more on these. Uh, Paulina, what 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 quote do you have? Uh, so the quote that I chose is actually from David Delaney's book Law and Nature, and it sort of uh, speaks to the current situation of animals. So this is what he writes. A being, a baboon, a talpin, a pit bull is doubly objectified, doubly reduced by prevailing discourses of power. First, it is reduced to animality and all that means and doesn't mean. Second, it is reduced to property and all that entails. It is positioned within forms of meaning and so positioned within circuits of power vis-a-vis the legal subject and vis-a-vis the state as the guarantor of rights of ownership. Its figurations as animals, as nature, as body, on the one hand, and as property on the other, are mutually reinforcing, and neither can be severed from the other. Because it is animal, it can be treated like property. Because it is property, it can be treated like an animal. Wow, that brought a lot of the things we've been speaking about here, about the tension between social and and legal. 
Right. So it's just sort of a reflection on the current uh, status quo, but uh, I really liked Hero's quote because it's more hopeful for the future and what we can do for animals. But yes, I think that sort of summed up the issues that we have been examining. I should have flipped you two around. I should have left us on a hopeful <laughs> note. Uh, Paulina, how about you? What What are your future? What What are you doing now? Right. So I just finished the first year of my uh, PhD coursework, and um, I'm going to be sort of building on the, I, the concept of animal personhood that I developed in my master's and uh, time, uh, in combining, expanding on animal rights and through the combination of uh, political philosophy and uh, feminist care theory. And I'm just basically interested in the question of how do we move, move forward in treating and caring for animals as uh, moral and legal persons and what sort of political relationships we'd have to them and how that would look like, how we'd communicate with them and so forth. Well, I look forward to seeing what you come up with because uh, you've been incredible on the show here today and considering you're just starting your PhD, I look forward to seeing uh, what what kind of ideas you have three years from now. So it's been great having you here. Uh, if listeners want to get in touch with either of you to speak about something you've mentioned in today's show or to follow your work, uh, how could they do that? Uh, my email is probably the best uh, option to contact me. It's uh, 13ps75 at queensu.ca. Um, that's pretty right. much Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Hira? Same. My email is probably my preferred way. Um, it's hirajalil at gmail.com. So it's my full name at gmail. Great. And uh I think, uh, is there anything else either of you would like to add about season one before we, we close up the show? I'm just incredibly honored to be part of the series alongside so many scholars. And it has given me so much hope for the future of uh, how animals will be treated in the law and society in general. So I'm just, it ends off on a good note of being hopeful and inspired. That makes me so happy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the same for me. It was a pleasure listening to this season. And I mean, I, I to be honest, I was a little intimidated doing this episode because of all of the amazing people that had done the episodes before. Um, so just hoping me and Paulina were able to do justice to this episode and you're doing great work and keep it up. Well, thank you. And um, you guys have been amazing. To, so this was a trial run of a grad review. And I think I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I learned a great deal. Uh, I, like, I started taking notes. You know, I listened to all of the episodes again. And there's something about listening to them all together as a body of work that gives you like an overview. And it was really fun. And both of you have brought up ideas in, you know, I think this shows the significance and the importance of speaking to others about your ideas and about the ideas of others, because both of you brought up things today that I hadn't thought about, you know, that that hadn't occurred to me in the interviews and that hadn't occurred to me after listening uh, to the episodes. So thank you, both of you, for being here today and uh, for the great work that you're doing uh, in university or in your own legal system. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all, folks, as Bugs Bunny would say. Uh, he would say it better than I did. But we are done. That is a wrap for season one. Thank you once again to uh, Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law, and Ethics, Apple, for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you for Jeremy John for the amazing, amazing logo. Thank you to Gordon Clark for the music that everybody's been commenting on. Uh, love the pig sounds. Uh, I wonder if any of you have any guesses about what that last animal is that closes out the show. If you have any ideas, let me know. Uh, and also, if you have any ideas on how the podcast could be improved feel free to reach out to me uh, the best place would probably be on twitter at the moment my handle is at claudia f town that's claudia f t o w n e uh, thank you again to everybody for season one season two is going to be awesome too we're going to be looking at animals and experience yeah so keep your eyes peeled for that this is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. Hi. <laughs>
For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!